everybody, it's Friday. Welcome into the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm Tim Dennison for Dave Schrader. A reminder that uh, as we speak right now, I'm in Chicago with uh, with Dave at Chicago Ghost Con. You can still get there a few tickets at the door at Chicago Ghost Con. We're at the Brower House in Lombard, Illinois. Uh, be sure to come out and see us this weekend. Say hi. Uh, if you're not quite sure where that is, darknessevents.com. Just go to that website, click on the banner, and uh, come see us. We want to see you this weekend as well. I also want to remind you that uh, we have the Halloween for Hunger campaign going on right now. And what that is, is during the month of October, and even into November, uh, we're going all the way up to Dave's birthday on November 26th, or 22nd, rather. I should know when his birthday is. November 22nd. Um, We are giving back as a paranormal community. Uh, Halloween for Hunger basically is us giving back. And what we're doing is we're taking and uh, raising money for Second Harvest Heartland. Uh, Second Harvest Heartland raises uh, meals for food shelves all over the United States. So with Second Harvest Heartland, what they do is they are a distribution center. And they take and distribute meals all over the United States for different food shelves throughout the United States. And it's they take your dollar, your one dollar, and they break it down to three meals for a person in need. So what we want to do is we want to take that dollar and we want to increase it to $15,000 over the period that we're collecting for. And we want to show everybody that the paranormal community is a kind, generous, and loving community. We know it is, uh, but we want to show everybody what we can do out there as a collective. So we we have our website up right now and actually a a website up at Second Harvest Heartland where you can donate directly. Uh, Just go to darknessradio.com. It's right there on the front page. You'll see a banner that says, uh, Beyond the Darkness and Halloween for Hunger. You just click on that banner. takes you right to Second Harvest Heartland's uh, website. And you can donate in any denomination. If you only have a dollar, that's fine. Donate a dollar. If you want to donate 25 50 100 there's different denominations there. Here's the deal, folks. We're going to be on different shows throughout the month. A month and a half, really. Uh, this show, Beyond the Darkness, Dave will be hosting Coast to Coast AM. Uh, We'll be appearing on different shows throughout Podcast One and uh, different shows. Dave will be on the Tom Bernard Show, different shows throughout the land between October and November, uh, promoting that we're going to be doing this for Second Harvest Heartland. And we're going to do our our damnedest to raise $15,000 for Second Harvest Heartland and get people fed before the holidays. This is an important time where these food shelves need to be filled up before the holidays. And we want to make sure that everybody has something to eat. Uh, before the holiday so we know you can do it we know there is a lot of causes out there that needed your attention uh there was hurricane harvey there was hurricane irma we know that those and especially the uh the hurricane in puerto rico as well we know there are people that need your attention and we know that all of us as a society need to buckle down and uh, we need to help each other out that's how we get along that's how we that's how we survive and uh there are people too Uh, right in your backyard in your neighborhood that need you as well especially with the holidays coming up and uh, we want to be able to help them out as well so i'll i'll quit beating the bush here but just go to darknessradio.com click on that link halloween for hunger and uh, help out your fellow brothers and sisters out there uh, this holiday season uh, with a warm meal and you can do that with just a even a, a gift of a dollar if that's all you have and uh Show everybody that the paranormal community is a kind, generous community this year and help us raise our our goal of $15,000. We greatly, greatly appreciate it and appreciate you. And uh, we'll give you a tally as we we continue along in the days and let you know where we're at uh, so that you know as well and and can keep up with us. And uh, we'll let you know on our social media sites as well where we're at. And uh, we'll do it together. 
we'll get through this together and uh and we're excited about it this is uh kind of our pet project every year and we get fired up about it and we can't wait we know we're going to hit this goal this year and and uh it's it's going to be fun uh folks we have a huge show today and i'm excited about this show a good friend of mine uh told me you know what timmy you gotta you gotta check out this guy john greenwald and his site the black vault and i was like the black vault and even the name kind of is titillating uh john greenwald jr began searching the secret inner workings of the u.s government at the young age of 15 he targeted such groups as and this takes some balls folks the cia fbi pentagon air force army navy nsa dia and countless others uh, greenwald utilized the freedom of information act to gain access to thousands of records he accumulated an astonishing number of documents on topics related to ufos the jfk assassination chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons, and top-secret aircraft. Through that time elapsed, and Greenwald's online archive became known globally as the Black Vault. And I'm telling you, you go to theblackvault.com and you will lose time. I know I went to it and I lost an entire afternoon. I got, I got sunk into it. Uh, his teenage project turned into the largest private online collection anywhere in the world, totaling near 1.5 million pages of material. At the age of 21, Greenwald published his first book, Beyond UFO Secrecy. In 2002, and we welcome into the uh, Beyond the Darkness, uh, John Greenwald. Hi, John. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, you know, uh, when when Mike said, you got to have John on the show, you, you got to talk to him, I, I went, uh, okay, you know, and you always uh, uh, approach something with some skepticism and you want to check things out. And the minute I went to the Black Vault, I went, ooh, because <laughs> I saw <laughs> free, immediately you see Freedom of Information Act records and you go, okay, well, this is promising. And then I started combing through the Black Vault and I started seeing what was there. And my, oh, my, how do you, okay, first of all, first question off the bat, where do you find the time to to accumulate those type of records? <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, I've been doing this now over, over 20 years. I started back in 1996 when I was still in high school. I was 15 years old. Um, so I do have a little bit of time on my on, on my side uh, to answer that question. That, you know, it wasn't built uh, overnight, and uh, and it's been a long journey. Like I said, I started when I was fifteen, and never ever ever would have dreamt that it would get to you know one point five million pages and beyond. And it's just me. It's just run by me. Um, you know, no help getting documents on there or anything like that. No staff of people. I just kind of do it when I can get some free time and put things online and and it the archive just grew and uh, I originally started with just UFO material I mean that was it it still remains my number one interest uh, but started with just UFO material and one of the toughest lessons to learn with the United States government when using uh, the Freedom of Information Act is uh, they are not fast at all <laughs> and <clears throat> there's no exaggeration there I mean they are incredibly slow with processing requests. Now, some agencies are better than others, but uh, really you wait a long time. You have to have a lot of patience. So what I learned early on was <clears throat> that very tough lesson. And so I started filing FOIA requests on uh, other topics as well, like uh, you had uh, mentioned uh, there in the beginning where I was tackling subjects like the JFK assassination mm -hmm. and nuclear weapons and biological weapons and pretty much any, at this point, any government secret you can imagine, I've probably filed a FOIA request on it. And I would get the material and put it online, and that's uh, that's what you see today. When you come to uh, like a subject with, uh, let's say, the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination, you know what's coming up, or you come to a, a situation where you know that some documents are about to be released in the FOIA, um, how quickly are you getting those requests in, knowing that it's going to that you have that lag time? Well, again, it's just kind of when when something comes across my mind to request, I mean, I just try and get it in there. When it comes to anniversaries and stuff, I mean, sadly, that really doesn't do anything for the release of information. Now, you had brought up the JFK assassination. This is a kind of one of the key years because they said that they were going to release 
uh, new material on the JFK assassination uh, mm-hmm. many years ago. Uh, they essentially have been holding these documents, and uh, you know, in, in October of 2017, which is where we're at now, they always said that they were going to release the final batch. Well, the National Archives, I, th- I think that this was probably to your question, I think they probably did this strategically. They started releasing records about a month and a half ago. Um, And I think the reason is that everybody was kind of prepared for the October release. So I think that all of a sudden they just turned around and dumped, you know, thousands and thousands of pages online uh, and said, yeah, we're going to release them a little bit early and be a little bit proactive. Now that sounds good. But again, you're kind of uh, circumventing that planned story for jur- from journalists and investigative reporters and stuff like that, and they put these documents online. So about six weeks ago, they, they released all these records, thousands of them. So I had uh, got myself a copy of them and put those on the Black Vault as well. So uh, back to your question, I mean, it's kind of hard to plan because any anniversary – of anything generally does not coincide with a release of information. I mean, this was kind of um, this was kind of a rarity when it comes to the JFK assassination because they have will, withheld so much um, and for so long. And I think that that's also part of the game because if you hold something long enough, the public generally loses interest. And I think that even though we still do have a fascination with that specific conspiracy of did you know was there a second shooter did lee harvey oswald work alone that conspiracy is still popular um obviously i i think with the passage of time people are starting to lose interest there's so much else going on in the world and i don't mean to laugh with that but i mean i think that that you know is is part of the game mm-hmm. is that there's so much else going on in the world wait as long as you can to release information because when you finally do the general public's not really going to care anyway and sadly i i think that we're seeing that with a lot of things not only in in association with the the jfk assassination but well beyond it i think the radar goes off when you say they released it a little bit early i think i think as a skeptic you say well the reason they they released it a little early is maybe some of those documents, and correct me if I'm wrong, might not have been all that important, that maybe they, they flood the marketplace with less important information. So you go, well, really, there wasn't much here. And maybe sources that want or that were eager to publish the information are kind of turned off by it and aren't looking forward to October 2017 mm-hmm. as much. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I don't say that there, would, uh, that there was any smoking gun of – of proving or disproving anything in that release of information. So you're not far off, you know, from the truth there. But I think that there is something to be said that if there really is nothing there, why did it take decades for them to release a lot of it? You know, what are they hiding? What are they trying to to, to cover up here? Um, Because no matter what your theory might be on the JFK assassination, then, you know, of course, I've, I've tried to figure out my own as well. Um, We, I don't think we'll ever know the truth. You know, I think that that's the fascination behind it is I think that so much time has passed now. And I think that history shows us that if somebody wants to cover something up, they generally can. Mm -hmm. And whether or not that that's, you know, destruction of documents and hiding evidence and so on and so forth, uh, that's not me being a conspiracy theory, you know, nutcase. Uh, that really has happened. Uh, you go to the CIA mind control experiments, right? That, that, then that sounds crazy. Well, why would the CIA admit to doing, you know, mind control? Well, all of that is a documented fact. It's not me, you know, giving you a conspiracy theory. Uh, my whole point of bringing this up is the guy who did one of the deepest, darkest things during those ex- experiments, uh, Richard Helms, uh, d- before he became the director of the CIA, he did something pretty awful, which resulted in the death of one of their own CIA agents. Uh, instead of being fired, which you would think would be the logical thing, uh, he rose the ranks, became the director of the CIA, and one of his first orders of business was to destroy almost every document on the CIA mind control program known as MK Ultra. All of that is documented. All of that is in congressional testimony. But it proves that if you want to hide something, you have the ability to do it. And I think that history shows us that. So with the JFK assassination, yeah, there could be, you know, millions of pages that we can read and get ourselves bored to death until our eyes bleed. Uh, But the real smoking gun that's going to really tell us what happened 
in my opinion, that's probably long gone or we'll never see the light of day, sadly. And, um, and again, with the passage of time, you know, this just gets deeper and deeper into the history books. And sadly, the public stops asking questions. Why? Well, we have a lot of other ones to ask, especially this day and age. Uh, but, you know, what happened to, to John F. Kennedy just becomes less of an interest. And, and that's unfortunate. I'm not saying that that's a good thing. But that, that really is sad. I'm wondering, you know, as, as I look at all this information that sits on the Black Vault, why the need to document even the weirdest things in, in government, and do you think that there are things going on in the government that aren't documented and aren't put out there for, for our consumption? Uh, let me ask you, do you mean why the need for me to archive it or why no, the no, need no. for the government to have all this stuff? Yeah, why, why does the government feel the need to document everything they do, or, or, or do you think that there are things going on that they aren't documenting? I think, you know, the one th lesson I, I feel that I've taken away in the last 20 plus years is, th is the government does document and they document everything. They document the documents, literally, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, they have paperwork archiving and documenting the paperwork. And it's a very confusing process. Now, why do they do that? Well, a lot of when you go back in time, keep in mind the Freedom of Information Act hasn't been around forever. So when a lot of these documents were being created, even going back to with UFOs and Project Blue Book and, you know, the post Roswell flying saucer era, all of those documents were created with the mindset that they would never see the light of day. So I think we have to take that into consideration that for decades, uh, you know, the government was doing some pretty dark, deep secret stuff. Never did they think a law would be passed where that information would become public. So I think that that goes to your question where I don't think they felt the need to, to, to essentially document it. They just didn't feel the need not to because it shouldn't have seen the light of day. People like you and me should have never laid eyes on those papers. As time goes on, now, you know, you're in the digital era. So now paper's kind of a rarity. You know, everything is documented in computers and on disks and in emails. And, and as we know, emails have become a very uh, key talking point with politics, um, you know, even in the, in the public arena. Uh, but behind the scenes also, there's a lot of question marks on what really is a quote-unquote government document, is, is a tweet uh, considered a, a government document, and it's a fascinating. I mean, some people might consider that a little bit boring and dry, but it's fascinating in the sense, especially with the president that we have now. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle, and I'm not trying to turn right. it political. Right. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on, but he's obviously very active online. So mm -hmm. the question mark is: is if he puts a tweet out and regrets it and deletes it, is he destroying a government document? And, it, and there's very specific legal questions to all of this. So documenting uh, within the government nowadays, they don't have a choice because everything is electronic. So again, to kind of summarize that, in the past, they never thought the documents would see the light of day and the public would never see it. Fast forward to today where they don't really use paper, everything is electronic. Um, now they're essentially saving and archiving and, and, and uh, um putting everything on hard drives. And so, yeah, it, it, it's amazing to see how much data they truly collect. Um, and then the question mark is how much do they save over time? And, and that gets into what they call a records retention schedule and do they keep emails forever? And I've gotten into some legal battles with some federal agencies trying to get uh, emails, which are government documents, that mm -hmm. is the law now, um, trying to get emails uh, from specific government personnel and they say uh, they're either deleted, gone, or they're inaccessible. Uh, and that, of course, is kind of breaking the law of the Freedom of Information Act. So it's an amazing debate. I mean, dry at times, don't get me wrong. No, but no. With, the, with the government in this day and age and the electronic era and everything is on computers, it's, it really is fascinating to see but also makes it very difficult because the Freedom of Information Act, when trying to target computers and electronic emails and files and so on, gets pretty, pretty difficult and fairly confusing at times. Now, you know, you say it may be dry, but it's actually very fascinating because you think, you know, and I go to the, the next place I go to is the Freedom of Information Act. And almost to me, when you look at the actual act and the, 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 intricacy of the law itself it almost looks like a, a cya a cover your ass type of thing it 
in that, well, we'll release it, but we'll release it after such time where anyone who may be implicated would be long gone or dead or or um, at a point where a statute of limitations may, <laughs> may have run out. Yeah. Um, do you find that frustrating? Do you think that maybe that law should be amended so that there, the information may be a little bit more timely? You know, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, if you start passing amendments like that to release names, I mean, uh, exemption, what they call B6 under the Freedom of Information Act, when you see blacked out information uh, on a government document, it's not just blacked out and given to you. It's cited with certain exemptions. So there has to be a reason that they're blacking it out. And the name of somebody is already in the act that they can black out. So to, to your question, I think that should there be an amendment? No, just simply because I, I think for privacy reasons, those names should be blacked out. Uh, but I think that agencies, depending on the agency, they have different internal rules of what they will release um, that may pertain to a particular person. Even though the name is blacked out, sometimes you can you know, deduce who it is. Then the question is, should the general public be able to see those documents and, in essence, figure out who's underneath that blacked out? And that's a big question mark, because what if that person is innocent? What if they, you know, didn't do anything? Um, and then all of a sudden their phones are going to be flooded and people are going to be emailing death threats, and we all know how the general public can be. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's frustrating for them to withhold information like that, but you have a lot of repercussions if you start releasing information like that because now you're implicating people in conspiracies or cover-ups or some really cruddy things that the government is doing. Now people can find who that is or they can find somebody who knows who that is and take the next step. So it's frustrating, but again, it's that double-edged sword. Like if you do amend it, you're going to create possibly more problems than solutions by doing so. You bring up an interesting point, and that is erroneous documents. Um, let me ask you this question. When we bring up things like you know mind control, UFOs, um, government conspiracies – Everything is documented within the government. So if you're on some sort of a wild goose chase, you're documenting it. But that paper mm -hmm. trail is out there for, for all time, and anyone can access it. Uh, in the hands of a conspiracy theorist, a wild goose chase on paper can be turned into a wild story that lives out there for all time. Do you think mm -hmm. that we've taken some of these wild goose chases that have been documented and turned it into something bigger than it might, you know, that it might not have been? Absolutely. I think that the government kind of hurts itself by blacking out so much information in, in some cases. Uh, I think in some it's warranted and we shouldn't know what's underneath it. In others, when people see all that blacked out information, y you have nothing but your imagination to try and figure out what's underneath it. And when you do that, the, the, you know, the human mind is a fascinating thing. And you when you try and fill in the blanks, you come with you come up with kind of the most elaborate, the most creative, the most in some cases crazy theory that you can come up with, and uh, you know then the conspiracy theorist is born. The truth, yes, yeah, sometimes it is stranger than fiction, but not all the time. And I think that again, the government is hurting themselves by letting us try and fill in the blanks because then we're creating and concocting stories. Uh, that probably aren't even remotely close to being the truth, um, but we're doing it anyway, and then we're disseminating it. And in this day and age with social networking and computers and everything, I mean, it's not, you know, back in the day, you wrote a book about a conspiracy theory, mm -hmm. and you were lucky if you got it published and people read it. This day and age, anybody goes on there and types up a tweet, or they put out a Facebook status message, you know, or whatever it might be. And then that theory starts getting disseminated, and then somebody takes it, and the game of telephone takes over, and they hear one conspiracy theory, and they tell somebody else, but they twist it in the process, and you just have, you know, in the end, you just have a story that's not even remotely close to being uh, reality. And I'll bring up 9-11, um, and I don't want to, you know, upset you or any sure, of, no. of your listeners, Go but, yeah. you know, the 9-11 the thing is a prime example of that. I think the majority of the quote-unquote conspiracies behind 9-11 are complete fabrications, that 
that you hear, you know, theory X or theory Y, and you go, God, that's real, that's true. But when you actually look into it, you realize that it's nothing even remotely close to being true. Uh, but here we are, you know, this in, in 2017, quite a few years after September 11th, and we still have all these unanswered questions and all these conspiracy theories, most of which are unfounded, and yet uh, most people, if you walk on the streets and ask them, well, what do you think happened behind 9-11? They'll tell you, well, the gov- I think the government did it. You know, yet there's no evidence to back that up. Mm-hmm. There has been no person that has come out and said, I was part of being the architect. You know, I mean, like, there's really no evidence. Of, you can try and argue the explosives in the building, which I think is, is silly. Mm-hmm. Um, you can try and argue all these points, but it just falls apart. And most people don't go that far. They just read it on the Internet, so it has to be true. And I think that that, that is a big problem in this day and age. Um, and it doesn't make the, the government look good either, because the, the reality is, and here I'll just throw it out, that my, my theory on 9-11, there was a cover-up. It's just not what we think. Okay. I believe we shot down uh, United 93. I think that that's the cover-up. Um, I do not believe the government played a role in it, I, and I looked long and hard of, for documents and evidence or anything you know that would mm-hmm. help support that. I don't believe any of that took place, but I do believe we we potentially shot down United 93, and I think that that is, is the conspiracy and cover-up. But the human mind takes over, tries to fill in the blanks, and you have you know a very grandiose conspiracy that still lives on that the government did it and played a role in it and you know bush let it happen and this and that um and it's 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 scary sometimes because again people don't realize just because you read it on the internet does not mean that it's true i want you to expound on in your theory why we shot down 93 what where were they going to eventually aim that plane at I don't know where they were going to eventually aim it. Uh, it's not like I have any knowledge of that part. But I think that the, the theory is supported by President Bush, who in his book, um, and I was saying this long before he published his book. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I'm not basing this just on what he said. Mm-hmm. But when he came out with his book, he said that he gave the order to shoot it down. Now, that became a documented fact the moment a president said, hey, I gave the order to shoot it down. So – once once he put that on the paper, it kind of made even more sense to support the theory. Now, he also says in pretty much the same sentence, but the planes didn't get there in time. And I believe that the president truly believes that. I mean, you do have the plausible deniability. You cannot have a sitting U.S. president responsible for shooting down a commercial airliner full of American citizens. I mean, think about the repercussions of what would happen. Very true. Yeah. So I think that, that, that that's the motive for such a cover-up. The means is written by the president himself. In his book, he says, I gave the order, but the planes didn't get there in time. I believe he truly believes that. I believe that that the intelligence community or whomever uh, essentially gave him the plausible deniability because he's too far in the spotlight. And even though this sounds a little conspiratorial, I think that you have the motive, the means, and the opportunity to shoot that plane down. Now, I'm sorry, the, the Pentagon was already hit uh the the both world trade centers obviously that this was a coordinated attack and i believe 93 went down you know it's been a while since i looked at the timeline but i believe that 93 went down after after both of those were hit and if i'm wrong please by all means correct me um but but regardless of that you know we knew that at that point that it was a terrorist attack we Mm -hmm. may or may not have known where the destination was for that plane um but it was obviously going somewhere you know, whether it be the White House, whether it be the Capitol, but it doesn't really matter. It was obviously going back to hit something. And I think you have the motive, the means, and the opportunity where look at where it came down, you know, in this field where it didn't crash into a building. It didn't come down over a bunch of houses. It came into a field, and there was essentially nothing left, you know, like it was kind of blown out of the sky, right. essentially. Right. So do I have the evidence to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt? Of course not. You know, it's it, it's not there. I just think by looking at it, that to me is what makes the most sense of a cover-up behind 9-11. But, but the collusion story and the government, you know, being complicit and letting it happen and so on, I, I, I just don't don't see that part of it. Um, but that doesn't stop, you know, the, the Internet from going wild with those types of theories. It's just I think you, you have to use a little bit of common sense 
especially with conspiracy theories, which can get so kind of muddied, uh, especially with the passage of time. Yeah. But you have to use a little bit of common sense, and you've got to really look at when somebody says something on the Internet, challenge it. You know, do a Google search. And I can't tell you how many times that <laughs> you, know, you get in an online war, and I try not to, but you just you try and correct somebody, say, hey, just so you know, that, that's actually not true if you, if you look at this. And then, of course, you know, you make enemies and everybody's upset because mm-hmm. you're using, you know, facts and logic. <laughs> and there's no room for that in a good conspiracy theory. That's right. So then, you know, you're branded as like the devil. And it's like, well, no, come on, don't get mad. It's good to have a discussion, but you have to challenge what you read online. So I think that that's something that we're largely, largely forgetting to do. You know, one of the things I, I think I had brought up with you on air, or off air, John, that that I wanted to bring up briefly, and I'm I'm glad we're on this topic right now, and and uh, in the in the second part of the program, we'll move on to some other stuff. But I I'm glad that we're on this topic about the internet and conspiracy theories. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with the audience is that a good friend of mine who I did uh, extreme pro wrestling radio with, Big D, um, his radio station was the sponsor of the. Uh, Route 91 Harvest uh, con- uh, Country Concert in Las Vegas uh, last weekend. And he was there. His wife was sitting front row with a, uh, a bunch of friends. Um, and a woman who was two spaces over from her was shot and killed. Um, what's interesting about and, and and she got out. She got out with her life. Um, D was backstage, and, and he was actually on the stage at the time of the uh, shooting uh, sitting in the wings and then uh, got backstage. Um, so thank God everybody was okay uh, and, and, you know, d- didn't get injured and, and everyone's all right. Um, with that, I was astounded, John, astounded that within – now, mind you, I was up I was up editing till about, I'd say, 2.33 o'clock in the morning central time. And I see it comes over my phone that I see that there's a shooting at this at this uh, concert, and I know that D is at this concert. So I go to text him, and I get no response, and automatically I'm worried. I, I got an hour and a half of sleep that night, Sunday night, Monday morning, um, until he had put a status up on Facebook saying he was okay. Mm-hmm. I think it was, I want to say eight or nine o'clock Central Time. I saw my first conspiracy theory. On Mm -hmm. what had happened. And it was shortly after they announced the name of the shooter and exactly what had happened up in that hotel room that that the, you know, the details had been released as to what had happened and how everything had went down. Somebody already had a theory. MK Mm -hmm. Ultra. That was the Mm -hmm. first thing out of somebody's mouth. The next thing out of somebody's mouth. And this was actually on Facebook. Somebody had already written this out very nicely. And I thought. You know, you don't even have the pieces together yet. The investigators on the scene don't even have the pieces together yet. Is that yeah, this was the blood's a, not even dry yet? Right, exactly. That's, what, that's what's scary. And here was the theory, and I my jaw hit the floor. Mm-hmm. The theory was this was get ready for this, John, an Illuminati blood sacrifice in front of the Luxor pyramid. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Yeah, I don't mean to laugh, but I mean right. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, come on, you haven't. This is nine o'clock in the morning. The thing happened seven, eight hours ago, and you yeah. can't tell me you can go online and know that that's the case. I mean, ISIS yeah. hadn't even claimed it yet. <laughs> you know, I mean, if ISIS hasn't claimed it yet, how do you know it's an Illuminati blood sacrifice? Yeah. You know, and and to me, it seems like there's such irresponsibility. I do a I do a talk on conspiracy theories, which I'm going to be doing at Chicago Ghost Con this weekend. And in that talk, I look directly at the audience and I say, do you know who's res- who's responsible for the irresponsibility in journalism these days and the irresponsibility of false stories on the Internet? And I look right at the audience and I tell them, it's you guys. You're mm-hmm. responsible for it. And you want to know why? Because you were the people who wanted news faster, quicker. You wanted it right now. You wanted yeah. a 24 hour news cycle. You wanted to know things right now. You had the immediate need to know. So, you know what? 
somewhere in there, there were journalists that took shortcuts, that didn't verify yeah. their sources three times, that decided that they had to be first on the scene and not accurate on the scene. And somewhere mm-hmm. there was a, a an editor who said, okay, you know what, I'll take, I'll take your information and I'll run with it. And, yeah. and, and in that, that's where the fault lies because you guys wanted it. It, it created a rating, which created advertising, which kept the media going. <clears throat> yep. It's, it's not, and you, 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 you said it brilliantly, by the way, there with first on the scene, not necessarily accurate on the scene. Right. That is brilliantly said. Right. And, and, and now it's it's gotten so out of control, and and I think people are seeing you know in in this whole, and again it, you know people I can I can hear people you know their their minds turning and and some people sighing right now, but and I'm only going to address this for about two minutes. The whole fake news thing really mm-hmm. is a is a it turns me off when I hear fake news when I hear the the term fake news mm-hmm. because it's a term thrown around to deflect it's it's not a real term fake news to me is is a term used to deflect when you don't want to acknowledge that the news that's coming out is real fact with a spin you know i mean essentially that's what you're getting from the networks these days is real news with a bit of a spin um and that's what you get from both cnn and fox but if you look Uh at if you look at news from below the network level that news is not spun the news at your local level is not spun there's no reason for it to be Mm -hmm. you know um and and it it disappoints me when somebody says oh my you know my my local news station is trying to trying to sabotage my governor no they're not (laughs) they don't have any skin in the game they don't care about your governor you know they're 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 reporting on what's going on in the state capitol and and they're moving on they've got shootings to cover and they've got stuff to cover and there's too much going on in their news cycle to you know to to barely keep up um so you, you know what and there's this there's this misconception you know from working in media i know from working in media there's this misconception of people that the media is this all powerful organization that controls the world and controls all this information and and it just doesn't work that way. I don't think people know that. No, it, it doesn't. And you bring up a, a lot with those statements. I'll start uh, just responding to the media part. And mm-hmm. I, I, I've i said for a while now, I, I think the fake news label is simply like the new way of saying, don't bother me with right. the facts. My mind is made up right. already. You know, I mean, people are set in their ways. And if they read something that contradicts their belief system, they go, well, that's fake news. Mm-hmm. Now, in some cases, they're absolutely right. There's some sites out there that's like the National Enquirer 2.0. Mm-hmm. They make themselves look legitimate. They make themselves look like a news site, you know, but they're either satire or they're just so questionable. It's like, why do they even have visitors going to this website? But sadly, you know, they're getting visitors. And by people forwarding and not paying attention to facts and reality, some of those sites make a lot of money and they flourish. But there, there is that kind of inappropriate label of, well, that's fake news. Well, not necessarily. It's just you don't d- agree with it, you know, or it contradicts what you believe. So I think that that's becoming kind of an epidemic in this day and age of the, of the fake news label, because nowadays we are so set in our ways. I mean, I'm, look, I'm politically active in the sense that I feel like I know what's going on, you know, and I have my political beliefs. Mm-hmm. And I do consider myself standing on one side of the aisle versus the other, meaning I have a political affiliation, but I'm not afraid of the other side. Right. And I like to have conversations. You and I might be on two politically opposite sides of the fence. I don't know. For, we, I'm just saying that. But we could talk but about it. But we can it. have a com- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We can yeah. have a conversation. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there that if you disagree with their point of view, they'll unfriend you, they'll block you, they'll give you this big old F you, you know, forgive me for saying it that way, but you know, they'll, they'll, they'll just kind of give you, you know, the, the, 
uh, the brush off just simply because you don't agree with them. Mm-hmm. I love opposite points of view. It challenges me. Right. I mean, anybody who follows me on social media, you know, I don't do it every day. But periodically, I'll throw something out there fairly controversial just to have conversation, Mm -hmm. just to get people thinking, because that's what people don't do anymore. And every time I do that, I watch my friends list get a little bit smaller. (laughs) (laughs) And I realize, you know, and now on Facebook, you know, they max you out at at 5,000. Yep, yep. And, uh, and so, I mean, you know, again, no patting on the back here, but I've, I've been maxed out for a while, but I, I keep it just a shade under. So I have a, a bunch of friend requests and I do that just because, you know, when I know I throw something pretty controversial out there, my quote unquote friends that really aren't, aren't friends, obviously. And I watch that friends list just kind of tick a little bit lower, you know, and then I'll go and I'll add a few more and get it back, um, up there. But my whole point is, is that people are afraid to have discussions and when they're afraid to have discussions, everything but their own opinion is fake news. And that, that is a big, big, big issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, to your point with the, with the media brilliantly said, I, I can't say it any better than you did. Um, you know, with being, it, it was more about being first on the scene than, than accurate on the scene. That's perfect. I mean, that is, that is absolutely, you know, this day and age with the dying of, of print media, if it's not already arguably dead, yeah. you know, people needed those fancy headlines online and it doesn't matter about the facts, figures, and statistics. We need the traffic because right. traffic equates clicks and clicks equates money. And that's how we're, you know, we've, we've got the big logo on the side of our building, you know, so that that's kind of sad. Now to the bigger point that you made, and this is scary, that now when anything of note happens, uh, like well, you know, using the uh, last weekend's Vegas uh, shooting as an example, w- when something like that happens, there are two things posted online. One is the conspiracy theory. The second is the politis- the politi- I'm not even going to try and say it. You, they politicize everything. Right, yeah, yeah. And so they politicize the event, and, uh, and the conspiracy theories are attached. Now, there's nothing wrong with politicizing it, but the problem is there's a time and place. You know, you, you, I, I watched uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the, 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 uh, you know, the uh, pr- uh, press, press officer at the, at the – yeah, mm-hmm. the press secretary at the White House. And I watched her do the, the live – you know, uh, uh, kind of question and answer, but she had kind of a, a little speech and statement in the beginning. And it was very emotional, very powerful. And again, doesn't matter what, what side of the aisle you're on. Right. You know, it was a, just a very powerful statement. Mm-hmm. And like the second question from the media was about gun control and new laws and this and that. Now I am, I mean, I'll say it out there for, for just my point of view is I do support the Second Amendment. Uh, I'm a proud and legal gun owner. And just, I listen to that and roll my eyes going, but, you know, there's a time and place, you know, the blood is still wet on the sidewalks. Yep. And now all of a sudden we want to talk about, you know, banning this or banning that when most of the time in situations like these, the, the, the quote unquote tools that are used are banned already. You know, I mean, a fully automatic weapon like that is not legal. And yet, all of a sudden, they're talking about banning stuff. And it's like, well, look, you, how can you st- – there's certain things you just can't stop. Now, I don't want to turn this into a gun control debate, obviously. Mm-hmm. But my point is, is like when there's blood still wet on the sidewalk, we can't just start going out and saying, well, this is the Illuminati, you know, doing a sacrifice in front of the Luxor, um, because that's not healthy for society. No. And, and, I, and I think that, sadly, it's, it's easier for – for humans and 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 the human brain to kind of put a big bad evil label on uh what happened in Vegas. It can't just be as simple as this guy's cheese slid way off of his cracker and he just <laughs> lost it and he's a nutbag. Mm-hmm. It can't be that easy. It has to be the Illuminati, has to be mind control, has to be the big bad government, it has to be all of that because we can't come to grips with the fact and reality that fellow man and fellow woman can do evil things. It's easier to put a big, bad, evil mind control label on it than it is to accept that this guy was just a lunatic and that he did what he did because he was a bad person. And, and that's, I don't know if it's scary or sad. We have to come to, to that grips, you know, that, uh, you look at school shootings, Newtown, um, you look at what, what goes on and there are just people that are just bad 
And I think that there's no conspiracy behind it. There's no false flag. There's just some cruddy people out there. And that's the reality of what's going on, in my opinion. And social networking has really muddied those waters because now, going back to your point, the minute something happens, you know, false flag, conspiracy theory, mind control, Illuminati, New World Order, you know, there's certain buzzwords that go out there, and then that's what we start seeing all the time. And it'll get worse in the coming weeks. You know, I'm sure somebody will come up with that the guy worked for the CIA and he's got CIA connections. And Well, that's you know, already that, started because he was a uh, an auditor for Lockheed Martin. So automatically there's a mm-hmm. government contract there. So there's a government are, connection. Yeah. yeah. People are trying to put two and two together and they're getting <laughs> six, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, think, I think if you look hard enough into anything, you will find what you're looking for. Right. And I and I think that we have to keep that in mind with conspiracy theories because look, I'm all for a good one. I love you know talking about secrets and government secrets and conspiracies. But if you look hard enough, you can find whatever you're looking for. So you have to remember common sense and logic. Those are the two key things that I think largely are forgotten. So I'm a, I took a long way around to ask you this question. So now we, we look at the internet. And people get sucked in real easy, it seems like. It's it's the, uh, yeah. you know, the old fishing uh, joke where you've been fished in uh, by, a, by a news, a, a fake news site. And I'm, I am using fake news there. Um, you know, you, you get sucked in by a, an opinion site. You get sucked in by uh, Alex Jones. You get sucked in by whoever. And I'm just using Alex as a random. I'm not using, I'm not picking on Alex Jones, but you get sucked mm-hmm. in by whoever. Um as to an alternate version of a story that may not be true. So if it's so easy for people to get sucked into an alternate version of a story, why should they believe a government document? What is it about a government document that's more credible than what it is they're reading on the Internet? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, And and I'm not sure if I'm going to have a good answer. Uh, For me, when I was 15 and I started doing this, uh, you know, I – when I do public speaking, this is how I put it. When I was 15, I made um, one of the stupidest decisions of my life, which turned out to be the best decision I ever made. And that was when I was 15, you know, Google wasn't even a word at that point right. uh, back in, in 96. I mean, you weren't Googling something. I, I was using Alta Vista, And you ter- type in UFO, use the UFO example, you would still get hundreds of thousands of pages. Now it's like tens of millions. And when you read the different stories, you know, it was this, this was re- the truth. And then you would read the same story, but different facts. And then that website said, well, this is the truth. So that stupid decision was, because uh, I got sick and tired of reading different versions of the same story. I thought that if anybody was going to tell me the truth, it would be the United States government, right? <laughs> oh, like wow. how stupid and naive, you know, <laughs> well, I look, I was 15 and right, I thought, right. well, yeah. Hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to get the truth. Uh-huh. So I'll look for these, you know, government documents. Cause I've read about the freedom of information act and I read one, you know, document on there. Um, and then as to, you know, I quickly learned that that was, that that was not the reality of it. Um, but I think that the one thing with government documents, because they do tell a story, is that you really can't refute the facts on those documents. Uh, because when you get government documents, you're not getting editorials. And you're not getting, you know, books and, and written papers for the most part. You know, you're getting, in this day and age, emails, uh, y- if you request it. You're getting... Um, kind of the raw intelligence from FBI files and defense intelligence agency files and the national security agency. And you have to piece the, 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 uh, piece the pieces of the puzzle together. You have to lay them all out. And when you start putting together the pictures, you realize that, and, and you think that you're making some headway, you realize that you're just putting together a piece of an even bigger puzzle. And to, to your question, you can't really think that everything the government tells you is 100% reality. But when it says something that pr- is kind of kind of rocks the way you think a mm-hmm. little bit, mm-hmm. and it is something that maybe proves a conspiracy theory that's been hovering around for years and years, um, you know, they're not going to make that part up just to, to throw you off. I, I don't believe they would, because I think that there are smoking guns in the sense that it has shown some really cruddy things that the government has done in the past. Okay. Uh, it has proven that they are uh, have been 
uh, active in cover-ups in the past, and, and those secrets could not be kept, and they kind of got caught in the act. Um, could I try and doubt everything that comes across my desk, even from the government? Of course, but that's not healthy either. And I think that you have to approach the government side of all of this as, you know, for, for what, what it is. And you have to look at the government documents and, and determine where it fits in to the bigger narrative. Uh, because, again, it's not an editorial where if you go on to Fox News or CNN or MSNBC, uh, when you read an editorial, then you can ask that question, how do I know that this is true? But when you're looking at the raw intelligence files, um, of, of something, you know, again, and fill in the blank of whatever it might be. I just don't see that all of it is fabricated across the board. You know, I mean, I, I try and approach it uh, logically and with some common sense and then just try and, and make my own story and, and base my own opinions off that, but only use it as part of the story. You know, I, right. I don't think that when the government sends me a stack of records that it's gospel, you know, I, I don't believe that either. But I think that there is some kind of truth behind when the government gives you something, and it really does tell an important story. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's some truth and some strength behind that evidence versus going online and reading some Facebook post about the Illuminati. You know, then I, I, I would definitely put my weight behind a government document. Okay. Uh, at this point, let's, uh, let's take a break. John Greenwald is our guest. He is the founder and runs the blackvault.com. Check it out during the break. In the meantime, let's take a break and, uh, get a little scared here. Let's take and exercise our minds and check out theater of the mind. It's time for another edition from the dark hives of darkness radio. This is theater of the mind hijacked honeymoon by Brad Morrison. My wife and I had celebrated our 8th wedding anniversary, and we're just grateful we're here to remember it at all. We had one of those destination weddings. I know, annoying for attendees, but it was a dream of my bride to be married on a sun-drenched beach in February on our anniversary of our official coupling, Valentine's Day. So, being the ever-loving and mindful groom, I set out to make all those dreams come true. It was a beautiful ceremony. There were around 30 guests surrounding us. The day had been filled with love and lots of laughs with good friends and family. We returned to the hotel, conveniently located on the beach, a gorgeous all-inclusive resort. I'm going to withhold the name of it since I don't want it to sully their excellent accommodations and customer service with what happened to us that night. Further down the beach, away from the safety of our community and the boundaries of the resort. After a nice meal and a few drinks and family and friend time, the sun began to set and my lovely new wife looked deeply into my eyes and said, let's take a nice stroll down the beach at sunset alone. I was more than happy to oblige and absorb the beauty of the surroundings and hand in hand with the love of my life. Who could ask for a more perfect ending to an already perfect day? We walked down the beach, hands knitted together in a loving embrace, and we would occasionally stop to stare at the colorful reds, oranges, and purples of the sky as night made its way in and daylight bid us farewell. We would listen to the gentle sounds of the waves, the calls of the seagulls, and the peace of it all. Then deeply kiss and begin our walk again, listening to the distant strains of the luau music from the beach party at our resort. We hadn't walked for very long, maybe 10 or 15 minutes down the beach away from the resort, Away from safety, away from normalcy, lost in our love and chatting about our future, when our attention was drawn just a bit further down the beach to a girl. A girl in a white nightgown, all alone and beckoning us, with a pitiful cry and her hand outstretched, waving for us to approach and help. We are caring people, and this girl seems to be in distress, so we did what any normal, rational person would do, and began to pick up our pace down the beach. As we approached, she continued to back up, waving us on, calling to us. Help! Please help! We eventually caught up to the girl. Our hearts were banging and we were nearly out of breath. The girl stood by the pier that earlier that day had been dotted with tourists and locals fishing, walking and sightseeing. It was now deathly quiet, just the sounds of the waves beating the shores and the girl calling out could be heard. Hurry, please. We need your help. We got even closer to the girl, 
and she turned and began walking into the tide, under the pier, waving for us to follow. My first thoughts were, oh my god, I'm about to see a dead body. Are these refugees that had an accident? But as she got waist deep in the water, my wife and I stood at the shoreline, our spidey senses began to kick in. Something was off, really off about this. Then she spoke, a bit more loudly, and a lot more harshly. Come here, help us, we need your help. I squeezed my wife's hand a bit tighter as my voice strained and cracked a bit under the nervousness. What is it? What, what do you need? She just stood there waist deep in the water and kept motioning for us to follow. Wait here. I'll go, I told my wife. She held my hand tighter and shook her head. Come here. We need you, the girl insisted. We slowly began backing up, away from the distress call. We were overcome with a sense of dread and fear like neither of us had ever experienced before. Wait here. We'll go back to the resort and get some help, I cried out over the sounds of the waves. No, come here, she insisted again. We kept backing up and she began trudging her way back out of the water towards us, her head now tipped down and an irritated look on her face. She cleared the water's edge and began moving towards us. As she got about 10 feet away, our senses were now in hyperdrive. She glared at us from under her tipped head, her gaze burning at us from under her scowling brow. Come here, now, she said in a terrifyingly calm yet forceful tone. That's when she lifted her head and we could see her pale white skin of her face. The thin blue lines of veins mapping her steadily angering face and then those eyes. Deep black, solid black eyes. There was no white, just dark, shiny eyes staring right through us. We took off back down the beach toward the promise of safety in the resort and the surrounding area that was so brightly lit. We moved fast, and that's when I looked down and noticed. In the sand, the only footprints were those of my wife and I. I stopped for a moment and turned back to see how far we'd left her behind and to assure myself she was not following. She stood there in an increasingly darkening night and screamed into the night. I turned, put my head down, and continued my running, half dragging my poor, scared, and now scarred wife in tow, until the sound of luau music and laughter filled the air, and tiki torches burning bright lit our way home. We got back to the beach resort and approached one of the servers. We started to tell her about what had happened, and that maybe security needed to go down the beach to see if this girl needed help, and if there were more people in danger. The server grabbed the night manager, and we pointed down the beach, toward the speck of a pier that was barely visible from this vantage point, and filled him in on our experience. When we finished, he shook his head and asked that we never, ever, stray from the resort's property again at night, and he would see what he could do, but insisted we should not leave the property again. He didn't have to tell us twice. There was no way in hell we would go anywhere near that area in day or night again. The next day, we inquired about what they found, and we were told that no one went to check. No security was sent, and again, we were sworn to not leave the property at night, as the resort could not be held responsible for our safety, or their own for that matter. It wasn't until a few years later that we heard about the black-eyed children encounters that we finally realized what happened to us that night. We hold each other a little closer when we discuss that evening, and thank God, and each other, we didn't go into the water with her. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from beyond the darkness. Welcome back to the best in paranormal talk radio, Beyond the Darkness. John Greenwald is our guest. He is the founder of theblackvault.com, and I hope you folks have at least delved into it a little bit. I tell you, you can't delve into theblackvault.com and listen to the show at the same time 
you are not that good of a multitasker. I guarantee it. There is way too much over at theblackvault.com, but definitely when you're done listening to this program, check it out. There is so much over there. John, I got to tell you, I lost a good afternoon before I had to pull myself away from my phone going through the 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 site it's amazing not only the documents there but you have a whole side of the the uh, the black vault that's that's different stories that have been investigated and and like you said the, really the interest began with UFOs and and I guess my first question off the bat here is going to be about disclosure and documents. And as you started collecting documents having to do with UFOs, are you finding that the government tends to be more conservative and terse when it tries to label what these things are that they're seeing in the skies? Or are they more open about what it is they're seeing? Well, I think uh, in relation to UFOs, I, I really think it comes down to what era are you talking about? And I think during Project Blue Book, for, for those listeners who may not know, I mean, Project Blue Book, simply put, was the government and the military's investigation into what UFOs were. And it started in 1947. Well, it had a couple names, Project Sign, Project Grudge, but went all the way to, to 1969. And there were over 12,000 cases that they investigated. And in the end, after 1969, they claimed only 701 remained unidentified. And that was simply because they lacked the evidence to, to properly label it. Now, it is my opinion, and this goes to your question, it's my opinion that this investigation was not an investigation at all. It was rather an explanation. And documentation now, after the passage of the Freedom of Information Act and utilizing it, not only by myself, but there's been some amazing researchers that, that came before me that have pried loose some of these records, I think it is now proven that Project Blue Book Really, its aim was to explain to the public what UFOs were. Even mm -hmm. though the UFO may be unidentified mm -hmm. and they had no idea, they needed to calm the nerves of the general public. Now, according to the, to the government documents and, and what the government wants you to believe, all UFO investigations stopped in 69, and after that, no UFO information was ever collected. That is kind of the root of my research, which, again, leads into your question. During Blue Book, I think they tried to label everything as swamp gas, the planet Venus, you know, name the silly UFO explanation, and, and that's where it kind of was rooted, was Project Blue Book. Okay. But after that, with the Freedom of Information Act, I targeted every government agency for UFO records over the last 20-plus years. I've pretty much tackled all of them. And if you listen to the to the press statements of the government, nothing exists after 1969. If you look at the evidence, there are thousands of pages that actually exist. And do they label uh, what the UFOs are? Well, in a lot of cases, uh, we don't know. It's blacked out from top to bottom. I'll use one example from the Defense Intelligence Agency, which uh, you know a lot of a lot of people you've heard of the NSA because of what they do and phone tapping and yep. stuff like that. Yep. But most many people don't understand what the Defense Intelligence Agency does. Um, and they're another intelligence agency, and the statement, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, is very true. And you can prove that with documents. And the DIA has a mountain of UFO records, and many of them are blacked out from top to bottom. Uh, they are uh, considered top secret. We know that because there's a top secret stamp on the top and bottom of it. So whatever this UFO document has on it, we don't know. We know two things. It's considered the, the highest classification the government can put on it. And we know that they just don't want to give it up. They don't want to release the information. So we don't know if they're putting labels on this. We don't know what they're doing with the UFO information. It's not a conspiracy theory. Uh, when I request uh, information about UFO you know, documents, I specifically ask for UFO records because some people ask me, well, how do you know that that's about UFOs? And the very simple answer is because that's what I asked for. <laughs> um, if, you, if you know anything about the government, they're not going to freely give you something you didn't ask for. So you have to be as specific as you can be on a FOIA request, but not being too specific where you kind of maybe, you know, uh, get too specific where you miss out on certain things. And it's kind of a fine line to try and figure out. But that's how I know that they're UFO records is because that's what I asked for. So they give me all these documents and there's hundreds of them. You just keep going through page by page by page and they're completely blacked out or maybe a sentence here or a sentence there. And, and uh, most of them are dated from the 2000s. 
Now, again, going back to my, my point about Project Blue Book mm -hmm. is they said after 1969, they being the government, no government agency, and this is a quote, no government agency has ever taken an interest since then, then being 1969. Now, that's obviously not true. And some of the most heavily classified UFO material is from the last 15, 20 years. That should not even exist, let alone be the truth. And that's what's going on. And that's what they don't want us to talk about and, and to know about. Why? Who knows? So to your question, what are they labeling these things as? We have no idea. All we know is that with some of these agencies, it is the highest classification that they can put on it. Um, here's one other point. It's easier for me, under the Freedom of Information Act, in most cases, to get information about biological weapons tests on humans, um, some past really evil stuff the government did by testing weapons and stuff on, on humans without their knowledge. It's easier for me to get documentation on that. It's easier for me to get documentation on nuclear weapons, on nuclear weapons tests, on all of that. It's easier for me to get that than it is UFO information. Now, really? why is that? You know, why, why can't I see the components of this biological weapon or this, you know, fill in the blank? Why is it that I can get that released from the government easier than UFO information? It does not make sense at all. And yet that's the reality behind it. So it's a long-winded way of saying they're, we don't know what they're doing with this information. Um, and I mean, I can go on forever. There, 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 there is a, a pretty interesting story about a, a UFO regulation. I'm not sure if you want me to get yeah, into that. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, what, what's the regulation? Well, uh, one again, the basis of, of my research since kind of day one has been using the Blue Book uh, information that I gave you, and that was kind of the root of, of my investigation is, is to try and disprove that. And throughout the years, just to kind of summarize the story, I was looking for – uh, because obviously all these UFO records existed. Um, some were heavily blacked out, others were not. But uh, I knew that if they were collecting UFO reports, there had to be a regulation. And I searched long and hard, and I finally came across uh, Air Force, what was called Air Force Instruction 10-206. And this was the black and white proof that was dated well into the, 10, uh, into the 2000s, uh, revised multiple times. And my point with that is there was a, a chapter devoted to UFOs. Now, this was the United States Air Force, the same agency that led Project Blue Book and said, hey, we have no interest in this whatsoever after 1969. Don't bother us with any UFO records. Don't go anywhere else in the government because nobody cares. Right mm -hmm. now, I find this this Air Force instruction that specifically talks about UFOs, how to report them, what to report and where to send it to. And I, I mean, that's a pretty mind boggling thing. The same agency that says we don't care. <clears throat> and yet they have a manual instructing all of their Air Force personnel to follow it. And chapter five was all about UFOs <laughs> made no sense whatsoever. So I figured out where they were sending the records to which was the NORAD installation. So <clears throat> I filed a FOIA request to the NORAD installation and asked for all UFO documents. Um, specifically, the keyword here was called CIRVIS, C-I-R-V-I-S. It's the acronym uh, that under this Air Force instruction, it's kind of the acronym for what type of report this was. It's called a CIRVIS report. And the acronym stood for Communication Instructions for Reporting Vital Intelligence Sightings, right? Okay. So I was looking for these CIRVIS. So I filed a FOIA request to NORAD looking for these things, and within a couple months got a response that said uh, that NORAD was what was called a binational command, which meant not only did the United States operate it, but so did Canada. And with that fact, they were not subject to U.S. law and not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, meaning the UFO documents that I finally found were going to a United States Air Force facility were not subject to the Freedom of Information Act, and I couldn't touch them. Now, they claim that they looked for documents in good faith. I never understood what that term meant. But in good faith, they searched for documents, but they found nothing. Now, it took me about a year to figure out that the solution to this problem was in the letter they wrote me. And that was the fact that they were a binational command under U.S. law, or under U.S. control, but also Canadian control. So I thought, well, maybe Canada has 
an equivalent to the FOIA, and maybe I could go through Canada. And so I picked up the telephone, I called the Department of National Defense, and I asked him, hey, can a U.S. citizen request information under the, well, it's called the Access to Information Act. Okay. And <clears throat> he said, kind of hummed and hawed, and he said, well, if the information's been released, I don't see why not. And I said, okay, well, this is what I'm looking for, you know, before we go through the formality mm-hmm. of filing requests. I said, well, here's what I'm looking for. And I said, they're called service reports. I said, it stands for communication, and, and I started to say the acronym, and he interrupted me in mid-sentence. And he says, oh, yeah, I have them right here. <laughs> now, there's one, there's one really important thing about this. This is the guy that answered the phone at the Department of National Defense. This was not a UFO office. This was not somebody who knew who I was. This was not somebody who knew why I was calling. And yet, within arm's reach, he had UFO records, the same records that NORAD said, nope, sorry, we don't have any. Uh, he had them within arm's reach. And I was like, wait, you know, I was pretty dumbfounded. I asked if I could get a copy. And he says, well, yeah, do you have a visa card? And I was, <laughs> you know, I was, well, yeah, you know, I, I don't leave home without it. So <laughs> I gave it to him. It was like the best $4.50 I ever bought wow. or ever spent. And I bought these things. And he sent me a stack of about 100 of them. And I said, or he said, you know, by the way, before we got off the phone, he says, this isn't all of them. And I said, oh, okay. He's like, yeah, we have boxes of them over in archives. And so this was that irrefutable proof that NORAD was lying. The government was lying. They were collecting these UFO reports. I got the records. They're online. If you search the blackvault.com, there's a search engine. Just search for Canada UFO and you'll come up with it. And uh, on there was NORAD as one of the the agencies that were getting these reports. (laughs) So it was that irrefutable, like, this this is in in the sense of proving the lie and the Mm cover-up. In a way, this was the smoking gun. This showed that the agency that claimed no interest had an interest. Here, were, This is where the reports were going to. You try to file it, and U.S. law doesn't apply. And they said, oh, hey, buddy, buddy, we'll search anyway. But, oh, we didn't find anything. And yet the Canadian government says, oh, yeah, here you go. <laughs> so, you know, it was a very interesting uh, story. So to, to, I didn't mean to go too long on that, but no, to kind of finalize the story, uh, the Huffington Post uh, and, and a, a great investigative journalist uh, by the name of Lee Spiegel, who is no longer with that paper, uh, but he, I know he's still uh, active and he writes and investigates. But he was working for the Huffington Post at the time, and he, he called me. I had known him for many years, and he says, hey, I want to do a story on the Black Vault. He says, well, what are the top five documents you know that you have? And this was one of them that I brought up, and I gave him some others. And so as any good investigative journalist would do, he picked up the phone, he called the Pentagon. Right, And I welcome that because I'd love to get a response on, hey, why do you have this Air Force instruction on the books if you claim you have no interest? Right. And, th- and I remember this a couple years ago, but I remember this was about a Wednesday. Uh, we did the interview on a Tuesday. He called the Pentagon on a Wednesday. He never got a response back. Uh, he was writing through Wednesday, Thursday, Friday comes and goes. He had left a couple messages, no response. Friday night, I get a phone call from him. Now, I don't want to speak for him, but he knows that I do tell this story and, and – uh, and he can verify this as well. Okay. Uh, he called me pretty late on a Friday night. I was at uh, my sister's house, was not at home. And he's on the East Coast, so it was really late for him. He's like, John, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what? And I had shown him how to download this Air Force instruction from the Air Force itself. Now, government databases are pretty complex. Mm-hmm. and But I had showed him, hey, look, this is where you can go and download it from the military. And he was pretty amazed by that because that's irrefutable. And he says, uh, I went to finish my story. I haven't heard back uh, from the Air Force, but I went to finish my story, and I went to download Air Force Instruction 10-206, and Chapter 5 is gone. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm thinking, (laughs) this guy, you know, he's maybe going to the wrong thing or wrong document or downloading it wrong or, you know, whatever. I got home that night, and sure enough, Air Force Instruction 10-206 was completely rewritten and chapter five was completely gone. Now it had something to do with like hurricanes or something, uh, but it was the right document. And the revision date was 48 hours after his initial phone call. Wow. To, to ask the, uh, you're, yeah. And so <clears throat> what are the odds of that? I mean, the, uh, the odds of that are so astronomical, it's ridiculous. And th- here was a major media publication looking to spotlight the Black Vault and 
the top five documents. This was one of them. And obviously the story turned <laughs> to something mm-hmm. to something else at that point. Um, but they completely covered it up. They completely rewrote everything. Now, from what I understand, that next week, they finally called him back and said, oh, yeah, no, that was revised and, and UFOs were taken out. So it was, uh, you know, just old and outdated. But I had proved with their own documents that it, that publication was updated multiple times from like 2001 through about 2008, 2010, and UFOs was never taken out. And my point with that is the, the government had, or the military had many opportunities to realize that this entire chapter was outdated and they could remove it. And yet they never did, hmm. except when somebody asked a question. And so that to me was a, a major story to prove that the government and the military will do anything to cover up the UFO topic. And the question is why? They should have this on the books. There's no reason for them not to. And yet they felt the need to completely rewrite the instruction, and it didn't make sense. You know, it's funny with uh, different countries coming out and saying, well, here are files, you know, feel free to take a look. And although some of them may be limited as to what they're releasing, Mm -hmm. it's funny that that there's such a tight rein or such a tight grip still with with what the U.S. is doing. You would think much like with the uh, what they've done with uh, the JFK stuff, that they would just throw out little bits and pieces here and say, well, there's not much here, but here you go. Uh, yeah. And try to throw that smoke screen up, wouldn't you think? <clears throat> I think that they would do themselves a big favor by doing that, and they're not. And I, you know, I, I think that they're that they're really hurting themselves by one covering up the documents, which is provable and documented. Uh, but on top of that, being so adamant about saying we are not interested in in UFO information. Uh, to the point of saying, don't contact us, you know, go to your local law enforcement if you feel the need, but we don't care. And they're so adamant about that, and yet the evidence proves something else. And uh, that's really working against them. If they came out tomorrow and they said, you know what, we don't think that this is alien, we don't think it's extraterrestrials above us, but we're interested. So if you see something, give us a call. I mean, you know, we're concerned. Mm -hmm. Is the North Koreans somehow getting a plane over here? Are the Russians getting something over you know, the world is a pretty scary place right now. Right. So <clears throat> if a UFO is being seen over a populated area or a military base, which they still are even to this day, I would think and hope that the government would want to know. And they don't. They don't care. And that's a pretty scary thing that they're so adamant about saying, no, nope, we just don't care. Uh, when we know that they obviously do because they have, you know, reporting procedures for it, or at least they had. Um So it's a complete contradictory situation where they say one thing, but they're doing another. And I think that that's really hurting them. But one of the things that I've discovered uh, through the the Freedom of Information Act is you can – one part of the law is called a mandatory declassification review. Mm -hmm. And without getting technical, what this simply says is if I request something in 1995 and they black it out – in 2005, in 2010, and 2017, what was blacked out then is not necessarily you know, something that should be blacked out today. So you can request what's called an MDR. And so a lot of these UFO records that have floated around for 10, 20, 30 years, um, they've been blacked out, a lot, of, a lot of them very heavily. And so a few years back, I requested an MDR on these things. And I did it to the National Security Agency. I did it to the Defense Intelligence Agency. And the NSA was the first to respond. And uh, they have about five, six hundred pages. Don't quote me on the exact number, but it's roughly about five, six hundred pages, most of which are completely redacted. They're blacked out and whited out. They used white out. Uh, So it doesn't look as as damning uh, for them to use white out. Uh, But it is classified information. They don't give it to you. So I requested an MDR on these five, six hundred pages. And after a few months, I got a response back that they lost 100% of all of those documents. They just vanished into thin air. Now what they do have is the redacted version. So their story, their claim is that they, I forget when they first released it. I, it was probably about 25 years ago or so, uh, maybe, maybe closer to 30. Um, but their claim is that they redacted all that information and somehow shredded the originals. Right. So, OK, let's just say that that was reality okay. and that 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 was true. 
Fast forward another couple months, the Defense Intelligence Agency got back to me. They have about three, 400 pages, uh, most of which top secret, blacked out, top to bottom. So I requested an MDR on all of those. What do you think they said? They lost 100% of, of each and every one <laughs> of the originals, right? Doesn't make sense. Now, for one agency to have that happen, okay. And, and, when, and let me tell you something real quick. When a government agency either inadvertently destroys a document or loses a document, there is a gigantic investigation on yeah. what happened because that is a, a legal issue. Um, that's not me making it up. That is the reality. It's a, the office of the inspector general. Every agency has an OIG, and that OIG then is in charge of kind of it's like the watchdog for their own agency. And they will do a very big investigation on what happened, and they will do a report on what occurred and what they found out. And yet the NSA destroyed everything. The DIA destroyed everything. Have I found evidence of any investigation whatsoever? <laughs> no. And so, you know, what? what is going on with this topic? And I think it's because I did not give up. I didn't take the company line. Mm -hmm. I didn't take their standard, oh, well, we, we studied this from 47 to 69, and, and we don't care anymore because we, we've solved the mystery, and the mystery is swamp gas and the planet Venus. And I, I didn't take that when I was 15 years old. And here I am over 20, 21 years later, and I'm still going at it. And I think that they finally got so sick and tired of it, they thought, well, just tell Greenwald we lost them all. Because then what am I going to do? Sue them? <laughs> I, I can, but I have, no, I have no legal basis. I can't go into a judge and say, well, I'm suing them under the Freedom of Information Act because I have a gut feeling they're lying to me. You know, I, that, yeah. that doesn't, that's not going to stand. And so sadly, that's part of the game, that you have to play the game by their rules. They made the game up, and they're the referee. And you somehow have to figure out how to win. And it's a, it's a tough game. And I didn't mean to go off on a no, no, no. huge diatribe there, no. but I wanted to kind of tell you, like, that's the game that they're playing. And it's hardcore where they're trying to cover this up. doesn't make sense. There's no rhyme or reason. But whatever it is, there's something about the UFO phenomena that they just don't want us to know. You know, one of the uh, common stories you hear, or one of the things that, that people say is, you know, if you dig too deep, if you try to get too too close to the story there's always someone who shows up at your door or their wiretaps or someone's always screwing with you whether it's technology or whatever it is have you ever gotten any pushback from any government agency over over your trying to search uh, the uh, freedom of information act i've i've never in the 21 years plus ever had a threat or uh anything that i could officially connect to the United States government. Um, I'll say since I started, I've had 19 death threats, um, mostly from, you know, general public and stupid people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a couple I couldn't trace. I'm not trying to sound like a paranoid conspiracy guy. I mean, uh, it, it, to be honest with you, I believe probably all of them were just people that had no life online and decided to throw a death threat my way. Like I said, a couple of them I couldn't really trace. I had to report a few, got the FBI involved in one. But never from the government where somebody showed up at my door or knocked or called and said, hey, look, you're asking too many questions. You know, you, you, you got to knock it off. Generally, the government's, you know, pretty nice, professional. Um, I can tell there are some agencies that are definitely annoyed with me. Um, and I know that because the, the documentation proves it. There's two agencies. This is public record, so I'm not, not saying anything I shouldn't. Okay. Um, but the uh, FBI has what's called a Vexum list. And to be honest with you, I mean, I, have a, I, I write for a living, you know, you, you Vexum list. I wasn't really sure what that meant. Uh, and in essence, it was, it was the annoying requesters, those that were, you know, asking a lot of questions and requesting a lot of information. And there was only about 15 or, or 20 people on this list. Uh, and I was on the list. And so it kind of made me, yeah, yeah. And uh, I do consider that a little bit of a badge of honor, you know, but it showed me that they're paying attention to those that are asking questions. And the one thing that I do that most uh, FOIA requesters do not, there are some that do, so I'm not trying to say I'm the only one, uh, but most of them do not in, in that when they get the information, 
Uh, they don't do anything with it other than maybe write a news article or keep it for their own collection or throw it out. Um, most people do not put that information online, and that's what I do. I'll, I'll get a stack of 1,000 pages, 10,000 pages. I will completely take that entire thing, put it online, and it's all free for people to download. And, you know, that that's probably a thorn in their side because I'm profiling some pretty deep, dark secret uh, secrets of the past. And I, I don't think that they probably like that. The IRS actually has, which is one agency I do not want to mess with. <laughs> yeah. But sadly, um, sadly, they, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, I discovered uh, that they as well have kind of a problem list. And what, what they have is a list of people that if they request information under the Freedom of, of Information Act, they get routed to a special person and a special department because they need to scrutinize what kind of, with extra scrutiny, uh, what responses they're getting because of the media attention they can garner. And uh, reading through the list, I was the only actual person. Uh, most of the other ones, like Wa I think Washington Post was on there. So they were the organizations, and there were some news organizations. I was the only actual individual that was named on this list as going to the special room, <laughs> you know. Uh -oh. And it again, it makes you uneasy because you know – that's how I know I'm asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, documentation is showing I'm getting on special lists. You know, and that's not a threatening thing. I know that. Uh, I know you were asking about threats, mm -hmm. uh, but it does show me that I'm annoying them. And there are agencies that, I mean, I can tell are are not happy when my name comes across their desk. And I did have one gentleman uh, from the uh, Pentagon uh, off the record write me. And I only tell this story just to kind of show that there's really good people that work on the inside. Not everybody's big, bad, and dark, and, and secretive. And this guy told me that he retired, and I said, well, look, you know, your name is, is public record connected to responding to me, so how do I know it's you? And he had told me about a couple letters that I sent to his specific agency that no one knew about except that agency and me. So I knew it was him. And he said, you know, I wanted to let you know I'm, I'm no longer there. I quit um, and, and retired at this point. He says, I've had enough of the bureaucracy and the secrecy and... He said, you know, when you first started doing this, when you were 15, we all got a kick out of it. And when you, he called the company line, and I've adopted that since then. He says, when you didn't take the, the company line about UFOs and you kept asking questions, he says, you annoyed a lot of people. And he says, that's part of the reason I left, because you did not take that standard answer. And he told me one thing I'll never forget. This was quite a few years ago. He said, keep it up, kid. Hmm. And he says, he, he said, uh, he said, you know, you need to ask questions. You need to push because I guarantee they're not telling you the full story. And I, that was the only letter I received to him uh, from him. I, I wrote him back um, a couple times and, and never heard from him again. But my whole point with that is, yeah, there's some, some secretive people on the inside and they don't want the, the quote unquote truth out. But there's a lot of good people as well. And a lot of agencies are, are good to deal with. Um, you know, non-threatening. They're very accommodating. They want to help you. They want to figure out what you're asking for and get you the right thing. So it, it's a tool that I would recommend anybody who's listening. If if you have questions, whether it be about family members, you know, what their past is, because you can get personnel records, any government document you can think of, you can you can ask for. I would definitely give it a shot and try it because it's it's definitely worthwhile and you get a lot more than what you bargained for. So, John, I got to ask you, uh, knowing this, knowing that this this uh, government official reached out to you and mm -hmm. knowing that you're supposed to keep pushing and, and keep asking questions and knowing that you're a level headed guy. I mean, we've we've been talking now for for about an hour and a half and, and you haven't said anything that would make me think that you have any uh, mental capacity issues or anything <laughs> like that. Um, oh, that's a plus. <laughs> yeah, that is a plus, isn't it? Um what I guess the question would be, what do you think? And, and you see, like I said, you seem like a level headed guy. What do you think there is, is the big secret that they're hiding? What do you think that they're, you know, that they're trying to keep from us that, that they think we may endanger ourselves with? What's this information they're sitting on that that we shouldn't have? 
I, it's a, that's a great question. Um, in my opinion, um, and again, this is leaning away from the documents, uh, what I've tried to do with those documents that I have received, and there are thousands of them, I've tried to take every skeptical answer on what UFOs could be, meaning uh, any Earth-based explanation, not alien, and you can pretty much scratch them out one by one. And, and, and an alien slash extraterrestrial presence is, is pretty much one of the last things that you come up with. And let's just say that that's the truth. I think the reason that they're, they're covering it up, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, but let's just say that it is uh, the reality that UFOs are connected to aliens, that they're watching us for whatever reason, uh, that they are here and they know it. I think the reason why they're not telling us that is us. I think that we are the biggest threat to national security, we as the general public. Now, your listeners, yourself, myself, I think we'd handle it just fine. Mm -hmm. But the, in this day and age, I don't think people can handle such, a, uh, such an astounding announcement that the UFO phenomena is connected to aliens, and they are here, and we don't know what it is. Um, I, do th I feel strongly that it's a big possibility the government doesn't have any idea either that it's a phenomena they can't stop, that they don't understand, they can't fully grasp. And that in itself is kind of a threat. Because if they came out and said, this is, we believe that this is an alien connected phenomena and that that is what the root of all of this is, uh, but we have no idea what's going on. We don't know why they're here. We have no communications and there's no story to tell other than that's what it is. Um, that I think is a gigantic threat because here in America, you know, we take a lot of, um, there's a lot of safety in the fact that we're number one, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that we are technologically advanced, militarily we're advanced, uh, you know, we've got pretty much the best of the best. And when you all of a sudden find out that you're not the best anymore, the general public, I don't think can handle that. And that is I believe the motive for the cover up. What they're covering up, my personal opinion again, is they don't know. And I've gotten heat for that. I mean, I've, I've said that on the air before and people write me and go, how, did, how does the government not know? You know, you're an idiot for thinking that. Well, there's a lot they don't know, yeah. you know? And, and I use ourselves as an example that if we went to another planet and we found uh, a civilization, in essence, an anthill in the middle of the Sahara Desert, the intelligence gap between us and an alien civilization, if we are the ones venturing out, would be astronomical. Would we go down and communicate, or would we sit and watch? And I believe that we would sit and watch. And I think that if you reverse that, which is what I think is going on, and that we do have an alien civilization out there that can traverse the stars, we are the anthill. We are the ones that are so intellectually down uh, and low, and we are so young that we would not be able to learn what's going on above our heads and understand it and comprehend it. And I think that, you know, using us as an example, as we would watch, I think that they would watch. And that is exactly what we are doing by stretching out to Mars and putting robots on surfaces of other you know, planets and, and trying to, you know, inch our way out into the solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, we are such a baby in that regard. I don't think that we can handle it. So I, I think that that really is the motive for the cover up. Um, again, listeners aside, I think that you, you guys would probably be fine. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. majority of, of the world would not. And so it's my opinion that's what they're covering up, but I think I'm, I'm more confident in the reason why versus the what. Again, you use a phrase that's very interesting, and, and it, it, um, it, it got me thinking again, and, and you're right, a baby. Um, and in that, mm -hmm. when a baby reacts to things, it reacts to things with very violent swings and emotion. And yeah. uh, I don't know if you if you watch 60 Minutes at all. I brought this up earlier in the week with Dave when we were doing uh, Supernatural News. Um, 60 Minutes this past week was talking about the, the Hubble telescope and the fact that the Hubble telescope is getting ready to be replaced. And they were they were um, they were uh, pre or I don't want to say previewing, but they were they were featuring the guy who, who fixes the, the Hubble telescope. I think he's been up there three times now. Uh, and each time they've done an upgrade to the Hubble, they added like infrared 
and they can see further and further out into the universe. And as you're saying this, as you're saying that we're venturing out to try and find things, um, much like a child, like we're, we're, we're looking out there with childlike wonder. Uh, yeah. And if there is something out there that's looking back at us, we could react like a child. And a child reacts one of two ways. It's either loving and accepting or mm-hmm. it gets violent. And it, it reacts with violence and, it, and, it, and yeah. it lashes out and it doesn't know why. And there is, a I think, a huge part of society that would just lash out with violence and not know why. It just on, on instinct. Yeah. And I, I think it's it's that don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up mentality. You right. know, I mean, we were talking about fake news earlier and, and that mindset. I think that that plays a huge role in this discussion because – Again, people are so set in their ways. I'm not, again, saying anybody who might be listening, um, but those are our listeners and, and, and we are people that are proactive in trying to learn more and to discover the unknown. The majority of the people out there are looking down. You know, they're, they're, it's kind of the zombie apocalypse of the 21st century where, you know, people are walking the streets and they've got cell phones and typing away and texting and they're not enjoying the world around them. And, you know, as I watch my son grow up, he's three, he's my only, my only son, uh, my only child. Mm -hmm. And as I watch him grow up, I, I, I see the world in a whole new light. And I'm teaching him that technology is not everything that we have to learn what's around us and appreciate what's around us. I think so many people are not doing that. And, you know, exploding that to the grander scale, nobody's looking up anymore. You know, everybody's looking down at their phones and down at social media, and they're just not looking up and asking questions. And I think that then that is part of that that cover up, and we're just not taking this subject seriously. So if we do get that announcement one day, you're right. I think people are going to flail their arms and start slapping anybody and anything around them because they just don't know how to handle it, and they have to short circuit, and you know they they won't accept it very good. And I again believe that that is part of that cover up and the and the motive for the cover up because nobody cares anymore about asking these questions and tackling these issues. Um, and I think it's important. I mean, I really, really, truly do. It's it's part of why I do what I do. And I've been very lucky career-wise working in television. I've produced and, and written and directed quite a few television shows about space and intelligence and art, you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, would aliens be a machine? And that's a whole show in itself, by the way, yeah, which yeah. I am fascinated by. Um, and came to the realization that, that when we do come in contact, if we haven't already with alien life, it'll probably be with an artificial intelligence, a uh, silicon-based machine versus a biological-based, uh, carbon-based life form. And that's what scientists are talking about. And it's, it, you know, it's a mind-blowing thing, but sadly, most people are not looking at it and asking those questions, which I think is a huge mistake. Well, I tell you what, John. Let's uh, can we have you back again sometime soon, and 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 let's talk about that and some other things. Because uh, the of black course. the black vault is amazing, and folks, if you haven't checked it out already, while we've been talking, do do so. The black vault dot com is uh, is is everything and more. One point five over one point five million pages online of declassified documents, case files of UFOs and the unknown. Much, much more. There's message forums there as well. It, it, John even has an online store there with DVDs, spy products, and more. Um, and your book is there too, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's. I'm in the process of writing another one, okay. uh, so it's uh, out of print, uh, sadly. But if anybody's interested in it, I do think I have some copies left. So definitely write me. It's not in the store anymore, uh, but I am going to be publishing another one soon. All right. Well, let's have you back soon, John, and and let's talk uh, some other things because I know people also want to know if uh, the if uh, the government is covering up uh, cryptid sightings as well. So maybe uh, we'll jump into that too the next time we talk to you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I really appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you very much. John Greenwald has been our guest. And again, check it out, theblackvault.com. Well, folks, I hope to see you out in Chicago this weekend at Chicago Ghost Con. And uh, Dave will be back next week. And we'll have Supernatural News and Parish Air on Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Remember, Halloween for Hunger. Go to darknessradio.com. You can donate as little as a dollar and uh, feed a family. A a dollar, again, feeds someone three meals. Someone in need three meals for just a dollar. 
And uh, we want to, again, provide uh, $15,000 worth of uh, meals for people in need, 45,000 meals. We want to do that before November. And you can help us out. Go to darknessradio.com, click on the banner that says Halloween for Hunger. We appreciate you as a paranormal community. Show everybody what the paranormal community can do out there this Halloween season. We'll see you next week, everybody. Take care. This has been Beyond the Darkness. Darkness.